in the museum. It's downstairs. Uh, it's downstairs, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Very colorful. Yep. Johnny Rosley's grandfather. Welcome, Mr. and Mrs. Gordon. Doug and Mrs. Gordon, are you? Are you still judging? Uh-oh. Uh, welcome to uh, our program tonight, uh, but before we get into uh, Mr. Fishman's uh, wonderful program, just want to let you know what's coming up uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, next month, uh, April 28th, there will be the life of Frances Perkins. She was the first woman Secretary of Labor. Uh, it will be uh, presented by Michael Cheney of the Frances Perkins Center. Uh, he will have a book available for purchase. Uh, May 26, uh, this is a very popular gentleman that we've had a couple of times before, Ron Romano, doing the cemetery billboard monuments of 1800, uh, three of which are located in Cumberland. Um, and he'll have a book available for uh, purchase as well. So uh, keep that in mind. And now to Mr. Fishman. Uh, I'm going to say this wrong. Bernard Fishman, right? No, it's Bernard Fishman. And I, <laughs> Bernard Fishman served as an advisor and consultant to museums nationwide. He has written and lectured widely on archaeology, architecture, historic preservation, and a variety of historic topics. Uh, he was privileged to work on an archaeological dig in Egypt for three years for the University of Chicago. Uh, that must have been fascinating. As a veteran museum director, he brought 28 years experience to Maine's largest museum dedicated to the state's natural and cultural history. When he was appointed the Maine State Museum Director in 2012, he brought with him a wealth of knowledge and experience which he used to compile and edit the book, Maine in 112 Objects, which was published in 2018 and is the subject of tonight's lecture. Please welcome warmly, Mr. Fishman. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone at the Cumberland Historical Society for inviting me. That introduction that you had is a little out, out of date. It's, uh, I think we have 37 years of museum experience now, so that must have been written when I came here. So <laughs> it's nine, nine years ago. But, um, uh, as, as you heard, uh, the museum did the book that I'm going to talk about, and I do have a few copies for sale, of course, but the museum had never done a general book trying to talk about its collections, picking out highlights from its collections before. We'd done specialized things, but never something like this. So we sat around a table several times, picking out the kinds of things that we thought might be of interest to people, to get a sense, a taste of what the museum has. Because the museum has hundreds of thousands of objects. We have big archaeological and very big uh, uh, natural history collections. We think we have something like 800,000 objects. So these 112, we could say they're the cream of the collection, but they're just things that tickled our fancy and we hope they'll kind of tickle yours. And the 112 number just came out by accident. That's what we ended up with when we all agreed and, and went through that process. But the, uh, the Maine State Museum itself is a, uh, a very venerable and interesting institution in Maine. We're almost 200 years old, as I'll mention shortly. But right now we're going through kind of a tough patch because as some of you know, the museum building in Augusta has been closed by the state government for three years because we're undergoing a massive construction and repair project in the building to improve the climate control systems and the 
take asbestos out of the building that was put in there when it was built. So it's a big project. And when I wrote the book, I told the story of how the museum had been closed six times and opened seven times in its 185-year um, history, roughly. And now I have to say it's been closed s seven times and opened seven times, but first closed. So we will reopen, of course, and we're doing a lot of work online, a lot of work inside the museum. We're thinking about some big, new, exciting exhibits. So a few things in this book will never look that way again, exhibits that have been changed. So it's an opportunity to see that. But anyway, it's a, a pleasure for me to be here. I thank you for inviting me. This is the first time I've been out to talk to a live audience in over a year. And uh, it's very exciting. So if I forget, you know, uh, you know, how to, how to talk or something, you know, you'll understand why. But uh, so I picked out a number of um, objects uh, from the book to tell you something about to give you a taste of what the book is and a taste of what the Main State Museum is. We think the Main State Museum is the oldest state museum in the country. Uh, and the only competitor is the New York State Museum, which was founded in the same year, which was 1836. But we think we're a couple of weeks older. Uh, but I, ha I haven't gone to them to, to prove it. So I, I prefer to say, yeah, we're the oldest. We probably are. This what you're seeing now, this picture of George Washington, this painting, is one of our, is perhaps the first object that we can say uh, that actually came into the uh, museum. It's a, a copy of a famous painting of George Washington at the Battle of Dorchester Heights in near Boston. That was the Revolutionary War battle that allowed the American uh, revolutionary forces to occupy Boston. And there were a couple of painters, one named Endicott and one named Sweat in New York, who at that period of time uh, made a living doing lithographs and art prints. And they painted copies of famous paintings like this one, which was painted in 1806. And the original is in Boston. I perhaps should have had a picture of the original, but uh, I don't, it wouldn't, uh, the comparison would be unfair, I think, because it was painted. Um, uh, by Gilbert Stewart, and it's really quite famous. And um, the uh, two guys, Endicott and Sweat, made this copy, and they trundled it up to the State House in Augusta in 1836. And you can imagine what it was like to bring a painting through the woods and rivers and uh, forests of Maine in 1836. And they offered it to the state legislature for $1,000 which might be something like $25,000 today. And uh, I mean, every state legislature should have you know, a picture of George Washington, one of his glorious moments in the state house or their equivalent. And some of you, I'm sure, know that in our state house, it's up the, the stairs from the governor's office. And uh, they brought it in. And for Augusta, which was really you know, a clearing in the middle of the forest, practically, at that time, uh, it was very exciting. Local newspapers talked about it. And it was there on consignment. Uh, and one year went by, and another year went by, and many more years went by. And Endicott, who was actually the sort of the broker for this, wrote the legislature, and he said, uh, well, you've had my painting now for a couple of years. Do you think you might want to buy it? And they said, well, it's really very wonderful, and you know, we're, we're, still, we're still thinking about it. And a few more years went by, and he wrote another letter. And a few more years went by, and then his brother wrote a letter. And the brother suggested, well, maybe we could drop the price a little bit, maybe, maybe you know, half, $500. And there was no answer from the legislature, which was still enjoying the rent-free use of this wonderful painting. And then Endicott died. But his widow wrote the state and said, look, I will sell it to you for $300. And if you don't want to buy it, then you can roll it up and crate it up and put it on a steamboat and send it down to me. And at that point, the Maine legislature decided to buy it. And they got a very good buy, $300 for a $1,000 painting. And they beat out New York State, which had another copy by these two uh, of a George Washington painting that New York State eventually bought for $350. So Maine got a better buy, and uh, uh, the frugality and care of the legislators in Maine, especially where money is concerned, is 
established at a very early time. When Maine was a new state, there were a number of geological and biological surveys of the state that were undertaken. And uh, these uh, images are from the first one that was done in 1836. A geologist named Jackson, Charles Jackson, his picture's on the left, was the individual who uh, organized this survey and was paid for by the state. And we think of this moment as the birth of the Maine State Museum because within this circular that he sent around to a thousand people roughly, telling them that he was going to go on this journey, collect specimens, but that mainly he wanted the people from Maine to collect specimens for him, not just geological specimens, but animals as well. And it was a description of, of uh, early taxidermy and how to take the brain out of a small animal and things like that. And the idea was that there was going to be a main, me I'll call it a museum, but a couple of cabinets, cases of display items that came out of this survey. So we think of this as the birth certificate of the Maine State Museum. And uh, there's only one copy of this document that survives. And it was given us to us by Earl Shuttleworth, whom I'm sure many of you know as the uh, still very active state historian and uh, a wonderful uh, scholar of Maine State history. It was given to him because um, a collector he knew was interested in the postmark on the envelope it came in and didn't care about its contents. So we got the birth certificate of the Maine State Museum. And of course, we're very excited about it. And the section here talks about the intention to set up a display. And that was all very good. And about 1,600 samples came to the museum and were displayed in cases that cost a couple of hundred dollars to prepare. And that was a lot of money then. And a second survey was undertaken in 1861. And by that time, all of the specimens from this first survey had disappeared. So that was the first time the Maine State Museum closed, not intentionally. Um, I won't go through each particular time. But uh, the collection didn't last very long. And museums need to have a certain stability in order to do their job for a long period of time. And that didn't happen with the uh, Jackson survey. But uh, eventually, there was a second survey. And then in the 1890s, when the museum had been located in the State House and had become a kind of catch-all, oh, thank you, for all sorts of collections, uh, including the very important Civil War collections of Maryland regiment, of uh, Maine regimental flags and all sorts of other things. And it had developed into a kind of natural history museum that was especially um, um, uh, important to the fish and game department of the day. And uh, in the 1890s, a man named Fish from Jonesboro gave the museum a stuffed bald eagle. And that so uh, captivated the legislators that they began to collect more and more specimens. And by the time of these images, in roughly 1899, there was a full-blown, small natural history museum in the uh, State House where it remained off and on until 1948. And on the right, you see a very important object uh, that was given to the Maine State Museum in 1899, a chair made of deer antlers. And uh, this was the chair that sat, that was right next to the director of uh, the Inland Fisheries and Game Department, whose name was Carlton. And very soon, this chair became uh, uh, connected with almost supernatural powers. I know this from reading the newspaper articles at the time. And it was called the luck chair because the idea was that if you were a hunter and you came to the displays of animals in the fish and game department and you sat in this chair, you would have hunter's luck. And so everyone sat in the chair. And uh, Carlton enjoyed that and he loved the displays. Some of the animals he shot himself. He had a sort of a vision of having every main you know, larger animal represented by a specimen in the museum. And they, they got there in many ways, uh, confiscation through uh, shooting animals out of season. Uh, there were a couple of moose that had been hit by a train, uh, all sorts of things that were brought into the museum and specimens to uh, display. 
and the uh, luck chair is one of the very few things that remains in the museum from its earliest days because the museum kept changing, as I've already mentioned. It was being opened and closed depending on uh, circumstances. I'm going to have a small drink. And then mention this display, which is the Spear Mill. Uh, when the museum opened in the 1970s, and Maine was very progressive in setting up a museum, it raised um, almost $6 million in the 1960s to a bond issue. The museum had been closed in 1948. Uh, the legislature needed more room uh, for hearing rooms, and they just closed the museum. So uh, people missed it, um, and I hope they'll miss it now, too, waiting for us to reopen. But eventually, the people of Maine wanted the museum back so much that they were able to get the legislature to support a larger museum. And so for almost $6 million, the cultural building that we now have was built but the state neglected to support the ongoing expenses of the museum to any substantial degree, and it remained somewhat empty. The collections had been dispersed. Uh, there was a columnist who said that uh, it was Maine's great basketball court because it was so empty. And uh, uh, the museum staff did their best to um, fill it, uh, and eventually the legislature did support it very handsomely, and they continue to support the museum. We get about. 80% of our operating budget from the state. But um, in filling up the museum, some very interesting exhibits were developed. And this particular one is a uh, very interesting one indeed. This particular mill, which came from Warren and was owned by a family of that name, Spear, was sold to the museum for $1,000. Uh, museum uh, director and curator, Ron Clay, came and saw the, the building that was the mill and it had been producing uh, chairs and wood things as recently as the 1950s. This was in the 1970s. And it was recognized that this could be a great display for the museum. And so it was sold for $1,000. Uh, some of the mill was damaged. A school bus had run into it and demolished some of it. So it wasn't in the best condition. But the center part of it was brought into the museum. I'm sure some of you have seen it there. It was originally a water-powered mill. There had been a, a mill on the site since the 18th century, since the 1700s. But it uh, had been uh, rebuilt, and what you see here is probably from the 1850s. But it's the only water power mill of this dimension that exists in an American museum. It's three stories tall. If you, some of you have been there, you, you walk around it, you see other exhibits, sort of like the lighthouse in ancient Alexandria in Egypt with its ramps around it. But uh, you turn it on, and the wheels move, and the belts go, and water rushes in the bottom. It's real water. The water itself doesn't drive any turbines. But it's a very important exhibit for uh, showing early, uh, early water power in Maine, which, of course, was very important, and is a, a fascinating environmental kind of display as well. Now I'll, I'll give you some chronological objects. Uh, there, I'm sure that whatever of Maine was above the sea had dinosaurs, but we don't have them because Maine's history is so complex and so much deposit of material has been put on the surface of Maine over millions and millions of years that most of the fossils that might be in existence are very buried very deeply. And so only a few fossil specimens from Maine are known. And this is one the Scarborough Mammoth that was discovered in the 1950s and then eventually excavated subsequently. And you see a couple of archaeologists uh, with one of the tusks of this mammoth and some of the ribs. And on the right is a mammoth tooth. And you know, I'm sure you all know in detail the difference between a mammoth and a mastodon. Uh, but I'll just say for the very few who have forgotten that the, uh, the mammoth from the teeth and other evidence lived in sort of um, unforested, open tundra or plain. And the grooves on the top of this huge tooth were there to allow the animal to chew up brush and twigs and that kind of thing. A mammoth uh, has very sharp, pointed teeth for chewing up uh, much tougher vegetation. So when this animal lived in Maine 
roughly 13,000 years ago, it, uh, Bain was not forested. It wasn't vacation land yet. And there might not have even been any people. We're not really sure. We think that the first inhabitants probably arrived a little bit later. But it's possible that there were some mammoths and some, uh, some of the first inhabitants living in Maine simultaneously. But this skeleton doesn't show any evidence of it. It doesn't suggest it was hunted by people or anything like that. But uh, I we have uh, remains of this in the museum and uh, a few other uh, fossil examples, not quite as old, and that's about what is left from the fossil history of Maine. The Maine State Museum has a very large collection of early human uh, settlement and other remains, a very significant collection that's represented in the most complete exhibit of its kind that illustrates the different cultures that made up the Native American population as it developed. And here's an object from an important site, the Vale site, which I am showing you because uh, there's a, a very interesting dimension to this site. Uh, on this particular site, we uh, found, and the Maine State Museum has done a lot of archaeology over the years, but we found that there was a village encampment here of roughly 50 people in six family groups uh, based on the way the shelters uh, were reflected in the archaeology. And they understood that there was a run of caribou at this place over here. And they would lie in wait for the caribou seasonally to come through this narrow place, cross the river, and make themselves more vulnerable. So they would undertake huge hunting expeditions. And uh, the main weapon that they had was, were spears, spear points like this. And when they had uh, an attack on the caribou and got their food together for the winter, uh, it was very often the case that when they cast a spear, it would break. These stone points are actually rather brittle, and so the stone head might break. It might break off in a caribou, and then the people of the village would bring back the spear shaft to the village and, to provi and provide it with a new um, stone head. And so you get a couple of cases, and these are exceptionally rare, where the same stone point, broken in two pieces, is on different sides of the river or far from each other. Because in this particular case, the bottom part lashed to the spear shaft, came back to the village and was discarded there, but the point was left on the hunting site. And you, s you can see how they fit together beautifully. There were three points like that that fit together. This particular one was perhaps the most attractive. And you can see how erosion and the burial in different conditions cause them to be slightly different colors. So uh, just a very interesting um, uh, look into hunting practices roughly 12,000 years uh, ago when the first people came into Maine. And this is an object that everybody likes. Uh, everybody likes the Vikings. And uh, this is a Norwegian coin, a silver penny. It is the only authentic Viking object found in the United States. We know that the Vikings made uh, numbers of trips, many probably unrecorded, to North America, and a settlement of, a temporary settlement of Vikings has been discovered in Canada, in Newfoundland. But there's no evidence yet, at least, that the Vikings ever stayed overnight in Maine. There were no hotels, and nothing like that. And this coin is the only Viking relic that, we, that has been found in the United States. So in fact, it gets featured on all sorts of supernatural events programs and all sorts of things. Uh, there was one that actually run a couple of weeks ago, as one of my friends told me. But the coin itself is from the 11th century AD. It's from the time of William the Conqueror. It actually has a kind of connection. Uh, this coin was minted by a king who um, uh, was, was called uh, the Peaceful. And it was, uh, his father, his name was Harold Hadrada, attacked England and tried to conquer England in 1066, the same year that William the Conqueror from the other end of England tried to conquer England from the south and succeeded. But Harold uh, the Viking was defeated by the English king and killed. And his son was uh, taken prisoner and then released. His son Olaf Kige, whose coin this is, was allowed to go back to Norway 
and became Olaf the Peaceful and reigned for uh, 17 or 18 years. And um, uh, I'm sure he had had plenty of war. But how did a Viking penny get from Norway to Maine? Uh, especially if, as we believe, at least up to now, that no Vikings actually settled in Maine or had any camps here that we know of. It was found at a site which was a huge Native American entrepot, a kind of marketplace, where goods from all over that part of North America were brought. Things from uh, Newfoundland and from Labrador and from the South. So Native Americans would come to that site and trade. When this object was discovered, it had a hole in it <coughs> and it was worn as a piece of jewelry, which is very common. Uh, my wife finds, uh, collects buttons and she actually finds American coins 100 years old that have been pierced to be worn by people as jewelry. So it's not uncommon. So this was uh, certainly a trade object brought to the site almost certainly from Newfoundland or some place in the north. And there are a few other things like that that came to the site the same way. It was found by an amateur archaeologist who form fortunately did keep records. And as I've already said, it's the only authentic Viking item that uh, we know about. Really very interesting. And if only it could talk, I'm sure it would have some interesting things to tell us. We have a lot of history at the Maine State Museum. This document, which dates from 1699, is one of the earliest that we have that involves the Maine economy. And it mainly talks about beaver skins. And you see down at the bottom a kind of crude little beaver uh, as published in an early book about North America before people had seen a lot of whole beavers. But they got to see a lot of parts of beavers because beaver skin was an enormously important trade object in the 17th century from Maine and from other places. And uh, this particular receipt uh, is probably in two parts and shows two different groups of furs that had been collected um, at uh, Saco to ship down to Boston and uh, be put into the, the, the royal holdings there for shipping to England. In 1700, uh, England produced about 70,000 beaver hats. So it was a very important object. Uh, it's also an interesting uh, document because it comes right at the end of King William's War. And we've forgotten about all of these wars between the Native Americans and the English. There were at least six of them. And the, uh, the natives often held their own. King William's War was probably one of the victories of the Native Americans in Maine because with their French allies, they were able to keep the English from pressing farther northward and colonizing even more. It didn't last all that long, but uh, we forget that Native Americans were an important political power, both as individual uh, tribal or, or community groups and together, and they fought with other Native Americans. The British bought, brought Iroquois and they brought Mo Mohawk Indians from New York State, what is now New York State, to be their allies and fight against the Penobscots and the French. And this went on for almost a century before so many English settled in the area that they were o able to overwhelm both the French and the Native Americans because of their population and their resources. But we've forgotten about these wars, which were fought on a somewhat equal basis for a while. And this was written at the very end of that particular war where the, the fort involved was uh, particularly important. And uh, reading about the history is, is very dramatic uh, if you have that opportunity. As I mentioned, there were half a dozen wars, uh, Indian wars in Maine. And this is, uh, these are remains from another one. Uh, this is the 1724 war um, uh, in which a very important um, Native American ally whose name was Raal, Father Raal, a Jesuit priest, was killed. And at the top of the image, you see an English force or colonies force, which has come and destroyed the village of Norwich Walk, which was, as I'm sure many of you know where it is, it's not uh, uh, too far from um, Skowhegan. And it was a very important Indian village of Christian Indians that had been settled by the French and was um, directed by this Jesuit priest. And this priest was very active in supporting his Indian community against the English, standing up for native rights, 
and encouraging the, Eng the uh, natives in his community to raid the English. So there was a lot of bloody raiding back and forth. And eventually in 1724, the English attacked the village, they wiped it out, they killed Father Rao. And on the lower left are a couple of objects that belong to him that were found with other objects by an amateur archeologist in the 1920s. What you see there is a small pyx. It's a container for the holy uh, host, uh, something that would have been used in a Catholic ceremony. And it may very well have been the case that Father Rao was killed just after using this and other religious uh, uh, sacramental paraphernalia that he had on the site because other pieces are elsewhere. And so it is a very uh, significant and poignant reminder of the Indian Wars, and in this case, the destruction of a whole community. Uh, something like 30 natives were killed and the rest fled, and never again was this uh, community as, as important. But the viciousness of these wars is something to note if you begin to, to study them. And uh, on the lower right, you see a, uh, an obelisk which serves as a kind of uh, tombstone memorial, both for Father Rao, and you can see it today, and for the village that was on the site. Rao's actual burial place was probably within this area, but we don't know where it was exactly. Um, settling Maine wasn't easy. Maine is cold. It's uh, rocky, and uh, though it has good rivers, uh, making roads through it is difficult. And there were many huge land settlements made by rich uh, aristocrats, largely, and other favor favorites of the kings who received large land grants from the English kings in the 1600s and 1700s. And the descendant of one of these uh, proprietors, Samuel Waldo, found himself owning a million acres, a million acres of Maine. And of course, we know Waldoboro and his name is in many places. And he decided that it would be very good for his pocketbook if he turned his huge land holdings into income. But to do that, you need settlers. And it was really hard to get them. He did get some from Boston and from Massachusetts, the Plymouth Colony and others, uh, not very many. And he seemed to be a little uh, skimpy on the food and the support for these settlers that he encouraged to come to Maine. And so they, uh, they didn't like him very much and they didn't have enough food to eat and they complained about him. But he continued to bring settlers. Finally, uh, there was actually a suit in the Massachusetts court by the Penobscots saying that Waldo did not have the right to bring people to some of his holdings because they weren't his holdings. They still belonged to the tribal authorities. And the Penobscots won that suit, amazingly. So Waldo sort of shifted his attention to some of his properties and he reached out to Europe, and he contacted a uh, local aristocrat from the county of Neuwied in Germany uh, and proposed to him that he would give him 100,000 acres of his holdings in Maine if he would bring 1,000 Protestant settlers to Maine to farm it, and Waldo would keep the best timber, he'd keep the best sites of, for mills and things like that. And what you see here is the Waldo Charter that he signed with this count to bring a 1,000 Protestant settlers to Maine. And it says quite clearly that they have to be Protestant. And there are other rights that he uh, insists. We don't know if even one person came from Germany to Maine because of this document. The French and Indian War, which was the, as we call it on this continent, uh, was the last of the big conflicts between the English the natives and the French, and the English won and drove the French out of uh, the new, uh, new world, except for a couple of islands off Canada's coast, and uh, of course the sugar islands that the French still had. And that coincided with this document. And then Waldo himself died prematurely a couple of years after. So we don't know if this document was ever actually um, honored. But it's the only document that exists to represent in this fashion the arrangements that were made by some of these proprietors to get people to come to Maine uh, and wasn't easy to do. And so it's very important. Now how this got to Maine, we don't know. We bought it from a guy that bought it at an auction in New York State. We don't know where he got it. 
most of what the main state museum has is donated but we do have some funds for buying special objects that have been set up by by generous uh, donors in the past so we were able to purchase this with the help of, of a number of friends and uh, it may have come out of the Count's um, castle in Neuvi. Uh Maybe it was war booty at some point. Anyway, it found its way to the United States and it's a very important object for the museum to have because it represents this attempt to settle Maine with uh, European Protestants, only a few of which came. And here is Waldo over here uh, himself. He was a brigadier uh, general of militia and uh, had uh, many, many uh, hopes for himself that unfortunately were not entirely realized. Um, we have a lot of military items in the collection. And this is one, this is the oldest part of a US military uniform that exists. And it was more worn by a Marine named Samuel Wallingsford, um, uh, a Maine native who served uh, in the battle between the USS Ranger, which of course is on the left, and the HMS Drake during the Revolution under John Paul Jones. Uh, he was young, he was in his 20s, he had a wife at home, he had two children, and he was killed in that battle. He was shot down um, on one of the tops. It was a uh, victory for the Americans, John Paul Jones, you've all heard of. His clothing was, he was buried at sea, his clothing was returned to his family, which kept it in their possession for centuries and then donated to the museum. And it's always a very special moment when a family that has kept a precious heirloom for generations or even centuries might then give it to the museum for the people of Maine because we can always have to remember that the museum represents Maine itself. It's the state of Maine. So we are the guardians of collections for the people of Maine and the state of Maine. And this uh, wonderful uniform element came to us that way and the tragic story that it tells. And if you see this uh, in, as an actual object, it is amazing how small this man was or how thin he must have been. Uh, but uh, he died for American independence and we are honored to have this uh, relic of, of his uniform. We also, we have a large clothing collection and we have some very important Native American clothing as well. This particular cap was used by, in her youth, by the woman depicted on the right. Uh, she was colloquially called Molly Molassa. She lived on uh, Indian Island in Old Town. She was a presence in Bangor and in that area. Uh, her, her actual name, her French name is Mary Pelagi and uh, we think that the Penobscots would make hats of this sort for ritual purposes, probably to honor a girl's coming of age of maybe 18 or 19 years. We're not really sure, but it uh, has all of the decoration you would expect from a Penobscot item, it, uh, the, the particular style of it. And it is in fact, we think, the item that uh, Molly Molasses is wearing in this photograph that was taken about 1863, minus the feathers that, that have become detached, which means that this is from the late 18th century, the 1790s, and therefore is one of the earliest textiles representing the Penobscot Nation that exists. So it's really very important. Um, uh, uh, Molly Molasses had, uh, uh, was, was an important figure within the Native community and uh, was, uh, uh, the consort of uh, uh, Neptune, the lieutenant governor, uh, a very important figure in the native community. And she had a number of children by him, although they were never married. It's a very interesting personal story. Uh, we want to keep the history of everyone in Maine, including all the groups that have been here. And so an object like this is of great value to us. I mentioned, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, you, the book describes in greater detail the beadwork, which is really quite exacting. It's, it's really beautifully done. And you'll see similar kinds of wonderful handwork on a number of other objects I'll show you. Um, the War of 1812, which is uh, represented by this object here, uh, was not a great victory for the people of Maine. The British occupied about one-third of Maine to almost no resistance. But uh, Spencer Thomas of Bixfield joined the American Army, 
and he fought in the War of 1812. And he fought at the Battle of Lundy's Lane, which is shown in this picture. American military forces did very poorly in the beginning of the war, except for the Navy, which did very well, to the surprise of the British. But the American army and militia performed exceptionally badly. And it took years for the American military to, to learn its trade. We thought, evidently, it was going to be very easy to conquer Canada, and it wasn't. Canadians actually did very well in repelling us. But Lundy's Lane was a battle that was fought on Canadian territory, not far from Niagara Falls. <coughs> it was the bloodiest battle of the whole War of 1812. About 4,000 people on both sides were casualties. And if the Americans had just stayed on the field, it would have been an American victory. It was a very important battle against British regulars and finally showed that the American army had developed itself to the point where it could face them. Uh, we did retreat, but an important battle. And Spencer Thomas was shot in that battle, and he was shot in the mouth. And it took out seven of his teeth. And the bullet that hit him is there on the finger of this glove. And the letter, and there are a couple of others, describe what happened and the wound. At one point, the, one of his teeth was embedded in this bullet. And he credited the strength of his dentition with saving his life. And, uh, and maybe it did. He had a horrendous experience, of course, being hauled back uh, behind the lines in a bumpy wagon and you know, at a, at a point in our history when surgery was extremely primitive. But he uh, recovered, took him a couple of months, and he lived uh, apparently a, a quite um, uh, satisfying life. And you see a picture of him in late middle age on the right, um, uh, posing with his wife. And the family kept this relic too for uh, roughly 200 years before do donating it to the Maine State Museum. Unfortunately, somewhere along the way, the tooth had become detached from the bullet. So if you notice a tooth anywhere, you know, lying about, <laughs> you know, g give me a call. You never know. Um, I mentioned that we have some very important uh, native clothing and other kinds of clothing. And this is another uh, important example. This particular um, outfit, which is uh, Micmac, and the decoration here, which uh, has moose hairs and silver cuffs and the belly uh, quills of porcupine to create this really very elaborate decoration is very char characteristic of the Micmac. And it belonged to a British officer named Huygens, which is a, a Flemish name. And he apparently was part of the uh, British boundary survey that worked after 1842 to finally determine the boundary between Maine and Canada and New Brunswick. And pr presumably, this costume was made for him by native uh, craftspeople. And I'm sure he had that done as a souvenir of the time that he spent in the northern Maine woods in the proximity of Micmac and uh, other native peoples. We think we know about this because he, this, this person, migrated to Australia years later and gave to a museum there, or at least there isn't a museum there, a set of leggings of exactly the same style. So we think he had a number of things made up. Uh, when I was in Egypt, and you'll remember the introduction mentioned I worked there for a few years, I had a native Egyptian costume made for myself. So I sort of understand why he might have done that. And again, how this survived, we don't know. It is the only complete example of this kind of costume that we know about. Uh, it's called a capote, a French word referring to the hood. But um, it's the model for the mountain man kind of costume. And it became working clothes for native peoples, French Canadians, Americans, especially in those areas sort of in between on the borders, forest areas. And one reason why it is so rare to have a costume like this is because they were working clothing and they got used up and thrown away. And this one was probably only preserved because it was a very uh, elaborately decorated example that this particular British officer wanted to keep uh, as a memento of his time in the North Woods. So as I've said, very few even pieces of this kind of outfit have survived. And on the right, you see a drawing from the 1840s showing a uh, a Canadian person uh, in this kind of garb. So a very significant uh, costume. We only acquired it about uh, ten, well, nine years ago. Uh, 
and uh, from an auction also in Gardner, in Gardner of all places, can you imagine? We did our very best to find out more about it, but they wouldn't tell us anything. You know how auction people are, preserving the identities of uh, the owners and sellers. But we did find out what I've let you know about through uh, the kind of research that we did. Jumping ahead a little bit chronology, uh, chronologically, this is a, a beautiful temperance banner. Uh, temperance, of course, in this regard, referring to um, the swearing off of drinking spiritous liquors. Maine was the origin and center of the prohibition movement. Uh, the Maine law, as you probably heard, prohibited the sale of any uh, alcoholic beverage that wasn't for mechanical or medicinal use. And um, the, uh, uh, the, the mayor of uh, Portland was, was famous at the time for trying to enforce these prohibitions and even caused the, uh, uh, a riot over uh, stored liquor in, the, uh, in uh, the city hall, which resulted in the death of, of one person in Portland when the uh, soldiers fired on this, this cro crowd of Irishmen that was trying to steal the liquor in the uh, 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 town hall, of course, perished in the fire. But um, so this was a, uh, an organization founded in East Raymond and painted with a lovely picture of Neil Dow, the mayor of Portland, is uh, in the middle there, smashing open a cask of liquor, you know, just like all the movies of the prohibition times in the 20s and 30s. And uh, he continued, he lived into his 90s. He was a very interesting character, Neil Dow, and uh, served in the Civil War. And Maine became, you know, the first state to really have a temperance temperance presentation. Uh, and that remained until uh, prohibition in the 1920s was ended in the 1930s, and Maine was given the choice for its different towns to be wet or dry. But it's a beautifully painted banner. These things don't survive very easily. They would be kept in the uh, uh, kind of the community hall and taken out for parades. These were the days uh, when almost all men belonged to some kind of communal or fraternal organization uh, some still do, the Masons and temperance groups and, 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 and religious groups. Uh, uh, so there was an enormous amount of uh, belonging to these secular kind of dress-up organizations. They played very important roles in the community. Um, the uh, uh, East Raymond chapter of, of this temperance group was, uh, uh, should be honored because they preserved this wonderful banner for so long and then eventually gave it to the museum for us to be able to display. Now this, of course, is the main icon. Uh, this is the flag at the Battle of Gettysburg that Joshua Chem Chamberlain and his 20th Regiment defended against the uh, Confederate assaults. There's not a lot left of this flag, as you can see. Um, uh, you all know the story, uh, uh, beautifully depicted in the movie uh, Killer Angels in the book, uh, or Gettysburg is the name of the movie in which Chamberlain's regiment anchored the very farthest extension of the Union Army defensive line on Little Round Top. And attack after attack was made by Confederates, especially Alabama uh, regiments, to try to turn the flank of the Union Army and get behind the Union Army. So some say that Chamberlain saved the Union Army and the Union, potentially, because he prevented the Confederates from outflanking the end of the Union line and then being able to attack it from behind and maybe causing an enormous defeat. Uh, and at the end, uh, uh, when Chamberlain's men were running out of ammunition, he drew his sword and commanded them to charge down the hill against the attacking Confederates, which under normal circumstances would be suicidal. But after a whole day's fighting and everyone being exhausted and scores of casualties, they were able to uh, defeat the Confederates, take many prisoner, uh, Chamberlain has a story about how a Confederate officer pointed a pistol at him and fired but missed him, and we have that pistol. And uh, so Chamberlain was an authentic hero, and you see what's left of the flag, which was very damaged in battle and by souvenir taking, which was a custom of the period. And in the middle, you see a picture of what the 20th Regiment flag looked like at Gettysburg at a reunion in the 1880s. It was already a, a shred. And we undertook in the 1990s a big project with grants to uh, uh, conserve and repair all of our uh, 
regimental flags. We have uh, regimental flags from almost every main regiment. I think there are only two that didn't survive. And they've all been conserved and taken care of. But this one, not only the most, uh, uh, the most emotive for Maine, was also in the worst condition. So only a little bit of its original material survives. But it is uh, something that uh, uh, is uh, absolutely a wonderful thing. There were also 11 Confederate battle flags that were taken by Union soldiers. But they were all returned to the South in the early 20th century as a gesture of reconciliation. I personally, as a museum director, wish they hadn't. But um, that's what they did. And we only have one little Confederate flag that one of our main soldiers found in an abandoned Confederate fort. But we have all the regimental flags except for the two that I mentioned and well taken care of. Um, we have a lot of material from the Civil War. Here are hair wreaths, as you can see, from two brothers in Wiscasset. They uh, were both killed and died or died in the war, one in battle and one of disease, which was very common. Maine um, sent about 70,000 volunteers to the war, to the Civil War, and roughly 9,000 of them were killed or died. One of the highest totals, Maine uh, was one of the staunchest Union states. One Maine regiment suffered more casualties, uh, an artillery regiment, than any other in the Union Army. And so Maine's um, strength for the Union during the Civil War is something really to be proud of and that we're very proud to be able to uh, honor in the museum. This, uh, again, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this, uh, our famous engine, steam engine, the Lion. Uh, it was originally one of a pair. The other one was the Tiger. Uh, the tiger disappeared from history. We don't know what happened to that. But the lion was built in 1846 in Boston uh, by a firm that had started in Hollowell. And for about 50 years, it hauled lumber to Machiasport. And it was about to be uh, retired and pre presumably junked in the 1890s when uh, a man, probably, um, you know, my guess is that it's probably this fellow here, uh, whose name was Sullivan, who had started his career as a stoker on this engine, that is, shoveling coal, uh, or rather wood, into the, uh, into the boiler, and uh, rose through the company that it represented to become in charge of it. He brought the company, and he saved this engine from destruction. It was uh, displayed in a July 4th parade in Portland. It weighs nine tons, so it crushed the um, float that it was on. It ended up in Orono. Uh, they wanted to put it in a building, but it was too big, so they put it outside near the stadium uh, in a location that became, became the lion's den, of course. And, uh, but being outside, it deteriorated and was given to the museum in the uh, 1980s and uh, very beautifully restored. It is one of the oldest uh, steam engines that survived in the United States. And uh, I have read that it transported something like 100 million board feet of wood in its career, something to remember. And of course, Maine used to be one of the greatest uh, wood producing states. It still is an important one. And the greatest shipbuilding, or at least one of the top uh, two or three shipbuilding states in the Union because of the, the wealth of our forests. And uh, forests, of course, very, very important. Um, this is a very uh, interesting photograph, a tin tintype, of a Penobscot native man who is posing with his caulk boots, the boots that have the spikes on them, because he was one of the, uh, I'll call them lumberjacks, but who made a living, at least for part of his life, um, uh, navigating lumber drives through Maine's rivers to the various ports uh, or sawmills where they would be received. And that, uh, to be a logger in Maine was extraordinarily hard work, uh, very common. There were moments when 10% of all the Maine male workforce was employed in the wood industry or forest industry. And to be a logger with a pick pole like this dancing about on these logs, and there are films that show these guys. I mean, they're like circus acrobats. It's amazing the, the kind of control the best ones had uh, uh, opening up these log jams and sending them down. But to do that took a level of agility that's really remarkable 
and this man um, uh, must have been one of those. In the Victorian period, the Penobscots were particularly important to Maine, obviously in many ways, but in economic terms as uh, lumbermen and as tour guides. They made a very distinct um, uh, impression on the way Maine developed as a tourist location and their knowledge of the woods and the natural uh, conditions of Maine were invaluable for those people, the so-called sports that came up from the south in the late Victorian period to see the wonders of Maine. I mentioned that Maine was a great shipbuilding state and we actually have part of a, a huge ship in the Maine State Museum. This is the St. Mary, it was built in Pittsburgh in 1890. It was the second to last full-sized sail-driven cargo ship built in Maine. Uh, no steam, nothing else, just sails. And uh, the reason that we have it is because it was wrecked on its first voyage. Uh, it's a very dramatic story. It uh, tried to avoid a collision going around the Horn of South America, but didn't. It collided with another ship, which sank. Uh, a storm came up and did further damage. And ultimately, it was wrecked on the Falkland Islands near Argentina, where, as you see in the lower right, it came to grief and remained in that condition until the 1970s. The captain committed suicide on this ship. Uh, the rest of the crew got off. Uh, though the, I understand that the crew in the ship that it struck all perished. Uh, just an ordinary cargo ship, Maine produced some of the last wooden sail-driven ships. Uh, it's part of what I call the stickiness of tradition. Everyone else was building uh, steel-hulled steamships, and Maine was still building some of these uh, large wooden cargo ships. But in an amazing story of preservation, uh, an archaeologist by the name of Throckmorton went to the Falkland Islands, engaged the interest of the Maine Maritime Academy and other uh, people and the uh, authorities there, and was able to bring back most of the section that you see in this picture to the Maine State Museum, where it has been installed and where you can actually see uh, one of these uh, majestic, or what remains of one of these majestic uh, ships from the 19th century. We don't have a lot of political history in the museum, but we have some. This is a very important scrapbook that was put together by the wife of Arthur Seawall, who uh, the bath ship master uh, owner, who uh, ran for vice president on the Democratic <coughs> ticket with Bryan in 1896. And Bryan was the populist, or he was the progressive. He made his famous cross of gold speech. He was for the farmers. He wanted farmers to have better access to, uh, uh, to credit for their businesses. Uh, Sewell was a, he was a capitalist. He owned uh, 90 ships, uh, also some very late period wooden ones, but some big ones as well. And uh, he was a Democrat, and, and uh, he didn't even know he'd been nominated to be the vice president until he met somebody in an elevator who told him. And uh, the assumption that he was chosen to give a lot of money to the campaign, at first he said he wouldn't give any, but he did actually give a pretty substantial contribution later on. And um, there was a big celebration in Bath. 10,000 people turned out when he and Brian came there. The, the telegraph company laid a line into, Brian's, into a Sewell's house so he could uh, get the returns. And it was a massive defeat for him and for Brian. Uh, even though the Democrats, through some kind of loss of, of, of thoughtfulness, uh, ran Brian two more times as their presidential candidate and lost both times. But uh, Sewell uh, didn't even carry his own district. <coughs> and uh, His son was quoted in the newspaper as saying he voted against his own father. And there was uh, a quote to the effect that if, we, if this is the kind of guy that we've got, you know, whose own son won't vote for him, then he's certainly uh, somebody uh, that, you know, to keep an eye on. Uh, but his uh, grandson became the governor as a Republican of Maine. But it's a wonderful scrapbook with these cartoons like on the, on the right. This is, this is how the, uh, the Republicans were looking at the Democrats in that election as a bunch of sort of hayseeds, sort of un unkempt and lived in the woods. And, uh, and, and their ideas were to try to get the winning candidate to give them more pieces of a pie, you know, somehow magically and all sorts of other nonsense. 
So there is certainly a lot of um, bile in uh, uh, political campaigns, but you know, to at least there's a smile. There's not a lot of smiling in today's political campaign. This is a very important tourmaline object that was given to Josephine Perry, the wife of the famous explorer uh, Perry, the Arctic explorer. Every item here is from Maine. The tourmaline from Mount Appetite, the gold from the Swift River. It was designed mainly by Perry and Josephine and uh, made by a jeweler in Portland. It's one of the finest pieces that uh, Maine jewelry ever made. It was made for their 50th anniversary and uh, we are very proud to have it. We are about to lend it to the Gem Museum because as I've mentioned, the museum itself is closed. But it's a beautiful thing to see. I hope you get a chance. We're very interested in folk art and folk craft. Here's an example of a Waldeboro uh, hooked rug of a very elaborate kind that was made in 1914 by Sarah Ugly and given to her niece as a wedding present. And it was that niece that gave the same rug back to the museum as uh, in, in, in the later stages of her life. And it's a really a beautiful thing. Maine has a wonderful history of artisanship, craftsmanship, from furniture to textiles to every, every kind of, of craft and uh, item. Uh, we have vehicles of many kinds, cars already been mentioned, and here's a hearse. As far as we know, this is the oldest hearse in any American museum, but we don't really know how old it is. It came from Alma, where the, towns, the town fathers debated for 20 years whether they should get a hearse or not. And uh, they finally did in the 1840s and they got this hearse, but we think it was a used hearse, <laughs> and it came from somewhere else. And they talked about in the town minutes how they built a, a hearse house you know, for the hearse, and they kept it till the 1970s. I don't know when they last used it. And then they loaned it to the State Museum for 40 years. They wouldn't give it to us, but finally they did. So now it's in the State Museum, and it's really very simple. It has a kind of Puritan feeling to it. You could put uh, vases of flowers on the shelves, and these little finials are somewhat decorative, but um, 20 years later, you got Victorian hearses of cut glass and walnut, and uh, just think of Abraham Lincoln's hearse uh, that went through all the cities and his body was brought back to Springfield. So this is sort of a, uh, a late survivor of this much, much simpler and, and less elaborate kind of funeral that would have been common in New England in Victorian times. Um, transportation always very important in Maine, roads being hard to make. Uh, uh, you can't get there from here, we all have heard that. Uh, this is just an interesting train wreck uh, of many, there have been many interesting train wrecks in Maine. Fortunately, nobody was hurt in this particular one. It's called the Mason's Wreck because a group of Masons from Skowhegan were coming to Wiscasset where they were going to be treated to a lobster dinner by other Masons, and this uh, train uh, was wrecked. It ran off the trestle. We <laughs> One of the passengers was quoted as saying in the newspaper that, that he was going very fast. He was going 10 miles an hour. So, uh, and the train lay there. It was in one of the narrow gauge railroads that Maine was famous for. This particular one, I think, had about 43 miles of track, uh, which is more miles than the, if I'm remembering the name, the, the uh, Kennebec Central or something like that, that ran from Augusta to Togus and had half a mile of track or something of that sort. But um, uh, not long after this picture was taken, they got oxen to haul the engine out and it continued to run trains into the 1930s when the depression put an end to it. The engine fell off the tracks, it lay there for a year. That was the end of that particular line and uh, a lot else including the abandoned schooners Hesper and Luther Little which many of you probably remember in this past that I remember as a summer camper because I spent almost every summer of my childhood in Maine. And we'd see them you know, going over the, the bridge and it, it just looks so romantic and wonderful. They were hauled up in order to uh, move lumber. Uh, uh, at least the idea was that they would move cut lumber from uh, the coast of Maine from Wiscasset to the Northeast and because they were schooners and they worked by sail, they'd be very cheap to run. But uh, the guy that bought them miscalculated. 
and he died. And so they were abandoned in place. They were never used. They cost $600, <laughs> so uh, not very much money. And uh, they were the most picturesque uh, tourist ruin in Maine for many, many years until something like 200 tons of debris were taken to the dump. And I still do very occasionally see tens and things like that made out of the wood from these uh, fascinating and, and very romantic reminders of Maine's past. Uh, this is the earliest gasoline-powered automobile built in Maine, and it's in the museum thanks to the Reiki family, which ultimately gave it to us, to the museum. Uh, it was uh, built by a, a tinkerer, um, and there were a lot of tinkerers in Maine, and there still are, and sold through a company called Burroughs. Burroughs also made uh, shades for windows and other things. And it was bought by a customer and driven only for 24 miles. And then he drove it back to his house, dismantled it, packed it up in his barn, and left it there. So the car was not altogether suitable. It's 1901, so it's very early. And it was eventually bought by antique dealers and sold from one to another, and then finally acquired by this fellow, John Walker, who's in the picture on the lower right. And he restored it, and uh, he did live in Maine for a while, but he lived uh, longer in New Hampshire. And he drove it in parades. He put about 100 miles on it. And he was quoted in the 1970s as saying, when the car was built and when it was new, it was a lemon, and it's still a lemon. <laughs> so it took a while for automobile technology to develop. Maine, of course, has the Stanley Steamer and other famous automobiles. We don't happen to have an example of that. But we do have this wonderful uh, early car, as I said, the, the oldest, as far as we know, gasoline-powered vehicle bought in Maine. I think there were 10 that were built, and this is of uh, this, uh, uh, this fraternity, you might say, and this is the only one that survives. Can't think about Maine without canoes. And the canoes, of course, were made by Penobscots and other Native Ma Americans, uh, and even the early explorers in Maine, the early European explorers, uh, felt the canoe was a remarkable invention its lightness, its maneuverability, its carrying capacity were remarkable. Uh, but to build a real canoe, you needed a lot of birch bark, and you needed big birch trees. It was a, an elaborate and time-consuming process. And as more and more tourists came from the south to visit Maine in the 1870s, especially 80s and 90s, when the railroads opened up Maine to tourism from New York and Boston and Philadelphia and places like that, there just weren't enough canoes. And so the first canvas canoes were built in Maine in the 1870s, we think. Uh, this is a very early example, but we don't know who built it. We don't know what company. It's, uh, it's earlier than Old Town Canoes. It's probably from the 1870s, but it has these interesting paintings on it which show, you might say, kind of romantic versions of Maine scenes. One of them shows um, the Kinneo House uh, near Goosehead Lake, which was a major tourist location for tourists who were able to get up that far. And we think this canoe, which ultimately came from an antique shop, but we don't know much else about it, uh, was probably something that was used either in a hotel, maybe in the Kineo House, as a kind of um, uh, collection object uh, to uh, interest the visitors, or maybe it was used in one of the main sportsman shows that were very common in the 1890s that Fly Rod Crosby and other people were involved in. But it's a, a rare surviving example of a very early canvas canoe when they were first made to replace the birch bark ones with this very elaborate painting on it that suggests uh, you know, the, the wonders of unspoiled Maine. Although the picture on the lower right you know, sort of reminds me of, of Mount Kilimanjaro. So I think there's a lot of imaginative uh, uh, figure uh, thinking going into that particular painting. As I'd mentioned earlier, Penobscots especially, but other uh, members of native groups in Maine became very important as tourist guides. And so here we have a couple of examples from that particular tradition. On the left, we have a uh, canoe seat back um, from a uh, native guide named Joseph Nicholas, who uh, carved it and the scenes for, as I've said, his sport the particular client that would come up and request his guide services uh, probably in the 1890s. Uh, 
uh, very beautiful carvings, and it's interesting to me, the lower one, of course, shows the kind of illustration that you find in a magazine of the period, and the upper one shows the native version of that kind of illustration of a moose, in this case, with the uh, elements of the heaven. It's really quite a remarkable object. A few others by this native artist survive in various places. Uh, these initials are the initials of his sport, who I think his name was Rose, or maybe he was. And here's just a picture of another guy named Louis uh, posing uh, with canoes and, again, reminding us of the importance of the native presence in making Maine uh, a tourism uh, destination in the uh, late 19th century. Another way to uh, appreciate Maine, both for business and tourism, was to take a trip on the excursion steamship to the city of Bangor. This was the largest steamship that was built uh, to take excursionists from Boston, ultimately to Bangor, but more often to Portland. Uh, an overnight trip, and you could have it for $6 in those days. And uh, they were very luxurious. You, uh, you could have food, you could have a cabin, you had uh, brass work and beautifully carved wood. And uh, I understand these ships weren't enormously seaworthy. They bounced around a lot in a rough sea, but that they were very, very luxurious. And I think we have, in our time, in our culture, we enjoy innumerable uh, advantages and technological improvements. But real luxury, real luxury is, I think, something that has diminished. And to go on one of these boats, based on the pictures that I've seen, uh, was to really go on a floating palace, uh, one that would imitate the, uh, the interiors of the mansions in Newport and places like that. It continued serving Maine in different ways uh, until the 1930s. It burned, turned over and burned in the 1930s at its pier in Boston. Uh, a lot of the, the narrow gauge railways and the uh, excursion steamships sort of came to an end in that period. Depression was very tough for Maine. Um, we are very interested, as I've already said, in all peoples. And some of you may remember an exhibit we did eight or nine years ago on Malaga Island, which was an island off Pittsburgh inhabited by a mixed race group of, group of people that were considered to be uh, uh, a blight on the main um, horizon by the governor of that period. His name was Plaston. And uh, uh, he visited the island where these uh, mixed race uh, fishers and scroungers were living, he said, we should, we should burn all of their huts. And eventually, that didn't happen. But eventually, Maine, through a series of really quite dubious transactions, was able to acquire Pittsburgh Island and expelled all of these people from the island with no compensation, no homes, and even dug up the dead in the cemetery and moved them to the, uh, the uh, Maine home for the uh, feeble-minded. So it was a a severe and depressing incident of racism that two governors apologized for much later, including um, well, one of our uh, recent governors. And the museum did an award-winning exhibit on this subject. And part of that exhibit was to find descendants of the people who had been expelled from the island and to develop programs with them, which we did very successfully. So this is uh, an important exhibit. And an archaeological dig was done there that we were able to receive a lot of the materials of. Uh, very common, you know, buttons and fish hooks and things of that sort, but very eloquent about the people's lives. And that's something we've always done and we want to do more of. As we develop new exhibits, we want very much to be able to tell the stories of people. And we will be having, not too long from now, something we're calling a listening tour, where some of our staff, our education and other staff, will set up meetings in different communities and just speak to people, like you perhaps, to ask you what you think of the Maine Museum. What do you think we should put in new exhibits? How do you view the work that we do? It isn't really about patting us on the back, but helping us think about how we can serve the community better and what stories you have, because the personal stories that are connected with objects like pictures like this is what makes the stories meaningful to most people who see them. Uh, summer camps, very important part of Maine history. Uh, I'm especially uh, attracted to that because, as I mentioned, I went to summer camps for 11 summers when I was uh, growing up. And here is a very nice panoramic view of the Wyanagonic girls' camp in Denmark in the 1920s, the oldest camps in Maine, founded in 1902. 
they had three uh, uh, sort of uh, groups of girls in the different camp levels. We know a fair amount about them. They lived in pretty rugged conditions compared to what you get in a summer camp now. But these girls were all you know, pretty up there. I mean, it was expensive to go to the camp. Uh, the uh, camp recommended outfitters in Boston and places like that. And um, uh, had all these activities. They were so programmed. I mean, they, they hardly had a minute to themselves. Lectures and sports and all sorts of stuff. And in the 1920s, it would cost you about $400 to send your daughter for seven weeks to one of these camps. Uh, today, I don't know, $12,000, something like that. When I went to camp, it was about $1,000 for the summer. So <coughs> things have uh, really changed. But Maine continues to be one of the great sources for summer camp um, uh, uh, exploration for children, although, of course, the seasons are much shorter now to be more affordable to people. But this is a very good photograph. It's a panoramic photograph, uh, which means, in this case, they had a camera on a spring, and the camera rotated. So the camp would line up. I remember, because I remember parents like this, and I have pictures of myself in the views they took, and it would start recording the image as it moved around with this kind of clockwork clicking. And so you could actually leave the <coughs> scene if you were on this side, and the camera was still taking pictures on this side, and it would not register that. So it was really kind of interesting. So the girls on the left here were, were not in that position when the camera reached the right, just a, a, a minor element. There were a lot of panoramic photos, though most don't show this kind of uh, activity, but many show just this people uh, uh, standing in groups and recording themselves. Uh, this is a, a funny story. Um, the natural history of Maine is complex and interesting. We have probably the largest natural science collection of any museum in Maine. We have a lot of specimens of all sorts of things. Very interesting for ecology and measuring climate change. Uh, this woman uh, from Waterville named Dorothy Small caught a fish, caught this fish. And uh, to her, it seemed like a white perch. And uh, white perch are native. I mean, they've been here for hundreds or thousands of years. But bass, large mouth and small mouth, were introduced into Maine in the 1860s, we think. And a lot of what you see was introduced. So invasive species is not just something we think about now. But anyway, uh, to her, this represented a record white perch. And a lot of people agreed. So it got into the record books as the biggest white perch of its time, caught in 1949. You see her posing with it. When she sent it to the taxidermist, he even sort of altered it a little bit to make it look more perch-like. But when the museum was about to do an exhibit and actually had the fish examined scientifically, it turned out to be a bass. So it wasn't a white perch at all. Uh, Dorothy is small, did not live long enough to, to know that her prize fish was not what it was supposed to be. So that was a mercy. But um, uh, it's an interesting example of, I guess, wishful thinking, but also the illustration of how Maine's ecology has changed. And I'm sure you're all aware of things like the forests are beautiful. Maine has 90% forest cover more than any other state. But the forests today are not those you would have seen in 1820. Many uh, species are gone, or at least the quality of the trees was much different. Huge tracts in the north are actually farmed, almost like wheat or grain, with, with the very short-lived tree crops. I'm not complaining about that in, in any sense, but just pointing out that the vistas that you see of Maine's uh, 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 natural environment, as beautiful as it is, and as good as Maine has been, much more than most other states in trying to preserve that environment, nevertheless can show a lot of changes from the relatively recent past. So moving up a little closer to the modern age, there aren't too many more uh, things to show you. But Maine's potato boy, William Finlan, uh, taking part in a World War II ad in 1944. He was chosen in the 1930s, 1937, I think, uh, to be Maine's potato boy when Maine realized that it wasn't selling four bushels of uh, potatoes to each person in Maine anymore, but only about two and a half. And so they put a potato tax on, and they marketed. They did restore the industry to, to a degree, but ultimately most of the potato production moved to uh, Midwestern areas that have much better transportation links. But Maine and potatoes, very, very important, still important in Aristotle County and other places. And this charming boy, 
uh, was featured in innumerable um, ads throughout the 1940s, uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s, advertising Maine potatoes to the whole world and kind of communicating that aw shucks, you know, wholesome farmer look that uh, actually was a, is a genuine and admirable part of some of Maine's culture. World War II, um, of course, affected Maine uh, as it did the rest of the country. You all probably know that only recently did we discover that a, uh, a U.S., I think a Corvette destroyer that sank off Portland was actually sunk by a Nazi submarine only a few weeks before the end of the war. Uh, and Maine uh, had about 2,000 deaths in World War II, so much less than the Civil War, but still a, uh, an immensely important moment in Maine and national history. And uh, this welder's um, outfit uh, represents a very important change for women in Maine because by the end of the war, the Bath Iron Works had about 12,000 workers, 12,000, and 2,000 of them were women. Only about three years after, they didn't want any women to work there who weren't uh, next to typewriters. And so this woman, Lucienne Doyon, was a welder, and this was her welding outfit. Uh, it had been used by a man before, his name is still on it, but she used it during the war, and we know almost nothing about it. Uh, she uh, did marry. We don't know anything more than that. Before her death, she gave it to a friend, a neighbor, and it was given to us. And it is very important to us to have this uh, welder's um, outfit, you know, for uh, 50 reasons. Uh, but one very important one is a way that it shows uh, women's greater access to uh, the, to the full part of life and the opportunities for women expanding in World War II and later, and at least we have a name, because as I've sort of suggested before, if we can have a name, a personal story that's connected to something, it gives us a lot more meaning. And here's something we all remember, I think, great tragedy. Uh, Samantha Smith, uh, who most amazingly became uh, practically an ambassador to what was in the Soviet Union when Andropov invited her to come there after she wrote him a letter asking if he wanted a nuclear war. And the Soviets showed her every, every courtesy and gave her a tour. And this was a Soviet uh, folk art costume that was given to her. Uh, and you see her wearing it and being pictured on the cover of Soviet Life. And of course, she died very tragically at the age of 13 in, in, in a most uh, just you know, horrific uh, uh, accident. Uh, killed was her father. Auburn Airport, um, and uh, a, a wonderful life that was cut short. And her mother uh, had a lot of material and ultimately gave virtually all of it to the museum. So we have a very important collection of Samantha Smith material, including lots of videos of her performances. She was on the Johnny Carson show. And there's a statue of her that's in the museum, as some of you may know, uh, holding the Dove of Peace with a bear at her feet symbolizing both the Soviet Union and the United States. A very interesting, significant, and poignant main story. On a sort of happier note is this story, this telephone system, which was the last hand-cranked telephone system in the United States at Bryant Pond when a phone company called Oxford decided it was time to replace this incredibly archaic and obsolete, obsolescent piece of equipment with a dial phone. And this was the kind of phone unit that you had to crank up, just like in the old movies. And uh, uh, there were, I mean, it was, it exemplified small town life. You could call up the operator and say, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to nap for the afternoon. So would you hold any calls till the evening? And, you know, this was the kind of phone that the children would call Santa Claus on. And it became a national story, as many of you probably know. Uh, the, uh, the phrase was, don't yank the crank. It was such a wonderful object representing the wholesomeness of Maine life and Maine's tenacity with tradition. You know, not stupid tenacity, but sweet tenacity. Um, of course, obviously, in the end, uh, it was replaced, uh, but uh, some years later it was given to the museum. And when we had, a couple of years ago, several objects that we wanted to present to people to get a sense of which ones had the most appeal to the audience. For some reason, this was the most attractive to younger people. The idea of a, a, a colossal monster like this having to serve a phone system 
was just fascinating to me. So as we uh, reopen the museum and the new education center that we're going to have there, um, uh, the Lunder Education S uh, Center, which they very generously provided some of the funding for, uh, this object will be there. And um, Maine's history with a lot of industrial uh, industrialization and de-industrialization. Uh, what you see here are the last three cans of sardines that were packed at the Stinson Seafood uh, uh, pack, packing company in Prospect Harbor. And we know the names of these women. The two in the back are sisters. Uh, we have uh, the cans signed by them. Um, and we actually have sardines in them, so we're going to leave them that way. Um, but Maine, at one point, you know, Maine was famous nationally because of its canneries along the coast. At one point, in 1950, Maine produced three million tins of sardines. And these are the last. And at the time the book was published, about two years ago, uh, it was a lobster canning factory. I don't know if it's still there or not, but um, a very important end moment in Maine uh, history. And then, of course, the labor murals. Um, Governor LePage didn't like these labor murals, and he felt, uh, or this one of his colleagues felt that they reminded him of uh, North Korean propaganda. So uh, they were removed from the Department of Labor and hidden, really hidden. The museum didn't know where they were. And uh, I have to say that after the governor won a suit which challenged his right to hide this, the, this art uh, so that he had that right, um, I, I called and I said the Maine State Museum would take them. They were destroyed. And, and everyone was very happy with that solution. And they were, and they still are at the moment, in our lobby uh, of the museum first on loan from the Department of Labor, and now they belong to us, it's a gift. We certainly want them seen. We're now thinking about how we can get good images and reasonable text uh, to go online. We're doing a lot of educational programs online. Some of you may want to look at our website and see some of them. But uh, because we're closed, we want to get important things out there. And there are 11 panels on this uh, labor mural, as we call it, representing different aspects of the history of labor. This is the last panel. I am told that the reason it's a little bit shorter was because it was cut down, because when they hung it on the wall in the Labor Department, it was too big, and it covered one of the outlets, electric outlets in the wall. Now, I haven't confirmed that, but I have been told that. It is certainly shorter than all the others, which are the same size. But in any case, here is uh, the older workman handing over uh, his tools to a new generation. That's what's represented. And in the back, you see uh, uh, vignettes of all the different kinds of labor. Now, of course, Maine is not a uh, hard industrial state the way it once was 60 years ago. So this kind of picture is interesting and nostalgic, but Maine's workforce does many different things. I mean, if you were to picture it, it today, it would be hospital operators and, and tourist motel operators and you know, uh, cultural agency uh, people and but it's a very uh, significant uh, artistic depiction of Maine labor history. Charlie Scontras, who's someone um, I knew only very slightly, but a labor historian who died just a few weeks ago, I think, uh, uh, is depicted in these murals. So it's a very important um, uh, demonstration of Maine's history and beautifully done. I'm, you know, because I was a historian of the ancient world and other things for a long time, I'm really sort of interested in public art. I believe strongly in public art being representational and telling stories, and this does that very well. So I think Judy Taylor, the artist, was uh, uh, exceptionally uh, skilled in doing this particular work, and we're very glad that we have it. And that is my presentation. So, uh, thank you very much. As usual, I'm sure I have gone over time. Uh, if any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And I did bring a few of these books, if you are interested in buying them, $38, that includes the tax. And because I'm, uh, uh, even though I'm the, the children of uh, retail merchants, uh, and my family had uh, stores in Maine, as maybe some of you know, M.H. Fishman did four stores in Maine until the 1980s. So even though I come from that heritage, I'm never prepared to sell things in the modern way. So if you want to buy this, you have to give me cash. I have a little change or write a check. I don't have a credit card.
But aside from that, um, uh, are there any questions that any of you might have? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the question is, uh, is there a time frame for the museum so you can uh, know when to get back? Well, we, we're hoping we can open sometime in 2023, so roughly two years from now, because this project in the building to take out all the asbestos there, to do other work, to replace the HVAC system, very long and very complex. And just clearing out the exhibits, we estimate that right now we're spending half of all of our staff time just moving, packing, protecting collections to get them out of the way of this construction. It's going to take a long time. But the exciting part of it is that when the museum opens, we want to be able to show you a lot of new things. We have many ideas. It's very expensive, of course, and we have no money. But you know that always comes next, uh, thinking about how to, how to actually fund them. But we have, for instance, some whale skeletons that we would like to mount in the natural history exhibit. 43-foot humpback whale with her calf to talk about Maine's ecology and seacoast. We want to redo uh, Maine, Meet Maine Here exhibit where we now have sawmills uh, to really start telling some of these personal stories in ways that we never have before. And we'll have the education center especially designed for students and uh, families with children uh, something we've never had before. You know, for all of the years the museum has opened, and we had, until the virus, the largest student programs of any museum in Maine, including museums three times bigger than we are. But they, we would serve the students on the floors of galleries uh, with, with rolling carts, very unsophisticated technology. We really want to upgrade that. So if you can put up with that weight, I, I'm trusting that you will see something really worth seeing and uh, really a new, a new, uh, new chapter of life for the Main State Museum. Uh, anyone else? Yes? Uh, that varies a lot. Uh, the question was how many paid staff do we have and how many volunteers? At the moment we have 20 full-time equivalents, which represents roughly 24 or 25 individuals, some of them working part-time. Uh, that sounds like a lot, and it isn't a small number, but we had uh, over 30 when the museum, in the 1980s, when the museum collection and responsibilities were uh, very small compared to what they are today. So the, it, it hasn't been possible to sustain that level of staffing. But when you look at the world around us, we do have to continue to be grateful to the state of Maine and the people of Maine, you and everyone else, for supporting the museum, allowing the state to support us, because without that support, we, we probably wouldn't exist, and we certainly wouldn't exist at this scale. Uh, volunteers, we have, you know, in a technical sense, we have scores, but because of the virus, we've really had to be careful, and only a small handful of volunteers working on specific projects have been involved with us for the last year or so, so that we can make sure that we maintain the the distance and the other standards. So we do s have perhaps half a dozen uh, working with us, but that's only a small fraction of what we used to have. But, you know, things are getting better. Things are changing. I got my vaccine, my first shot, a couple of weeks ago. I'm sure most of you got at least one. And I hope we can be somewhat back to normal within a couple of months. So if any of you are interested in volunteering for the museum, uh, send me uh, send me a note. I know you have my email address, which is bernard.fishman at maine.gov. It's probably, you know, be a little bit difficult to find good work, but not impossible. And we are very grateful to volunteers in our state report. We have uh, recently been publishing the number of volunteer hours that were given, uh, is which is usually in the 2,000 and 2,000 plus range. In other words, more than a whole full-time staff person. So very important for us. So if you have any interest or you know anyone that does, especially anyone that might have a special skill, I don't know what that skill might be, but people who love collections, love history, uh, cataloging, sort of detail work is an important part of what we look for. So most of our volunteers are sort of oriented that way. But uh, uh, we, are, we think of ourselves as a museum of the people and we want people to, uh, to be part of that. 
Anything else? All right, well, I'll thank you again. And um, <laughs> I will uh, move over to the table if anyone would like to.